Well, hello. Good afternoon. Um, I just want to start off with a little apology that if this uh, talk seems a little disjoint, it's because I didn't know I was doing it about a week and a half ago. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm here to talk about is uh, the evolution of augmented reality in Pokemon Go, and a basic description about where our organization came from, uh, what motivates us, why we do the things that we do, um, how we're going about achieving our mission, and what the role AR is playing in that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Where do we come from? Um, Niantic was formed, a small group of individuals inside Google uh, who came primarily out of the Geo and Maps organization. Uh, we, we came, uh, wanted to pursue a, uh, opportunities to use map data in new and interesting ways. Um, and John Hankey, who is our founder, was the head of product for Google Maps for uh, about 10 years. Um, so you, leveraging this data that people have never really used in, in the ways that we really wanted to take them um, was one of the things that we were after. The, the next question is, why did we do that? Um, well, John and I have kids. Uh, most of them are um, teenagers now. But when we started this project about six years ago, uh, we'd come home at the end of the day, and our kids were sitting at their television, at the television, watching YouTube, playing video games. And this, I think this cover for New Yorker um, kind of describes the feeling that we had. It's like if you notice, the two, two girls are sitting behind their computers playing Minecraft. And through the window is this beautiful landscape. And when John and I were kids, um, our days were spent outside, um, some of our most memorable um, Experiences came when we were playing outside. You know, mom kicked us out of the house, told us don't come back until dinner time. And I remember running around playing in creeks and doing really crazy things, and, and these kids are not experiencing that. And so we wanted to find ways that we could try and coerce people, um, convince them that there are really interesting and entertaining opportunities outside. <clears throat> and from that, we came up with our mission, which is adventures on foot with others. Um, our, our goal there is to um, inspire people to go outside, experience things, explore the world, discover new things about their community, and hopefully create um, uh, interactions with the people around them so that they can um, <clears throat> learn more about each other, learn more about the places that they live, and get a really good understanding of, of um, their, their home. So we started out with a couple of uh, experimental um, projects, one of them which actually turned into a full production product. It's called Field Trip. Field Trip is a, is a passive discovery tool. Um, it provides, a, in some cases, quirky information about um, locations around you. The objective of that, of that particular application was to provide information about hidden features of the world. It's like most people don't, uh, probably most of you may know by now, but initially Niantic is the name of a ship. Um, it, it represents a, uh, a collection of ships that exist underneath the financial district in San Francisco. Uh, most people don't know that the gold, during the gold rush, ships float into the bay, um, and the crews jumped ship and ran up to the hills. Without a crew, these ships were, were basically left moored at the docks, and there were hundreds of them. Um, San Francisco being what it was, they, they started to use these things. They pulled them on shore. They turned them into hotels, brothels, bars, you name it. Um, and the Niantic actually sits, um, a portion of it, underneath the Transamerica Tower in San Francisco. Um, most of it has been extracted and is uh, stored in the Maritime Museum. But there are hundreds of these ships all over, um, all over San Francisco. And the goal of Field Trip, uh, one of the first things that it described, were all these ships. It's like you'd walk around San Francisco, your phone would buzz, and it would tell you about one of these interesting ships that they believe existed. <clears throat> Another prototype that we put together was a game called Conquer SF. Um, it was a risk style game. <clears throat> we, we used it only in, internally. Um, it was a way to, to experiment how, with location-based games that, where the place had, had some impact on the gameplay. And what we discovered with that game is that um, the social interaction was the key driver, um, not, not the gameplay itself. It was, it was the taunting mechanisms that we had in the game, trying to coerce people to, to play interesting this, this game in a much more competitive way. And people, 
there were only like eight of us on the team at the time. We actually went to pretty great lengths in order to do some pretty crazy things. I mean, one, one morning at 5 o'clock, 5 a.m., um, a coworker and I moved our armies up from Mountain View into San Francisco and then proceeded to conquer all of San Francisco. And over the course of five hours, um, we almost wiped out all of the enemy um, except for seven locations. And then when he woke up, he proceeded to destroy us. Um, but it was that, that was that that one day where we spent maybe six to seven hours of that of gameplay. We realized that there was something really compelling here. <clears throat> and so we also experimented with um, what are called alternate reality games. I don't know if any of you've played those um, alternate reality games. They, they create a reality. You, you're running around in the real world. Um, you know, running into shops, asking questions of the shopkeeper who gives you a card. You run out. You go to the next stop. And th those are the kinds of things that we experimented with to try and understand how, how can we create games in the real world that, that motivate people to, to move around. And that led into Ingress. What was the net effect? What was the net effect of the Niantic project? We had crossed a threshold in which global security could be at risk. Decrypting the data was the mistake. This is not psychosis or some cognitive break, but an actual takeover of the mind. Much of the public sculpture found in our cities is based on design seeded in the human mind. Certain places have an energy that not only attracts people, but attracts events. The mission of 13 Magnus is to monitor the effects of mind hacking. Obviously, this will be done with the highest of security to make sure that the ideas do not contaminate or threaten humanity. This all leads to Niantic. I know that many tools will be needed to fight this battle. You just have to know where to look and know what you're seeing. Portals emit exotic matter into our world, and that matter has certain effects on our world. I started noticing that there were energy fields, anomalies on Earth all around me. A few of them exhibit properties that are as yet unexplained. I know that there are others out there. What if they're already among us, but we don't realize it? And I must be prepared to work with them or fight them. They are coming. Something's wrong out there in the world. This doesn't feel like a scientific study. The one hope lies in understanding what happened at Niantic. Not all mysteries are solvable, but the joy comes in the pursuit. So Igris was our first game. Um, our, our objective there was to get people out in the real world playing this game. And the, our goal was to get people to relate to the real world, not to the game itself. And so we created, a, I remember when we first launched this thing, people was like, oh my gosh, this, this UI is so stupid simple. I mean, there's just nothing really there. But that was the objective. Our objective was to get you to focus on the vividness of reality, not, not in some uh, some game. Plus, we didn't have very many people to work on it, so you know, high quality visuals really wasn't part of it. <clears throat> um, and then from that, it's like, well, were we successful? Like, well, we kind of were. Um, this slide shows an effect on players' behavior while they were playing the game. So, this, uh, several individuals actually did this. They they just used tracks to determine what they did during the day. And this is a path that one individual, uh, Gerwin, used um, while going to work. And you can see that his progress while playing the game was dramatically different. It caused him to explore places that he would never, never have seen before. Um, comments that were made, in fact, by the, the Pokemon company um, after they were playing Ingress was that um, the individual lived in his community for 30-something years and didn't realize the sheer number of shrines, you know, large and small, that actually existed in this community. And Ingress actually fostered his exploration and discovery of those things. Um, and that, and he met a lot of people along the way that were, were sharing those same discoveries. <clears throat> Next thing we, we experienced was we, we created events. Um, how can we foster social gameplay? Um, we created these little events. The first one was in Cahokia Mounds, just outside of St. Louis. Uh, I think there were like 40 or 50 people that showed up. It was a rainy day in November. Uh, the people that went there played, for, played the game for about three or four hours and had a great time. And over time, we decided, oh, let's every month, let's do one of these events. And we started doing multi-city events on the same day, creating collaborative gameplay across uh, continents. 
And you can see this is a, um, an event in Cologne. Um, actually, I think there were several, like 3,000 people at this one. And our largest one was in Tokyo, which had over 12,000 people in attendance. And this was, the, this was one week prior to the launch of Pokemon Go in Japan. Um, so these events were huge. I mean, we took a stadium to fit these people in the after party. And all these people were, were just had a great time. I got to go to one in Sendai, which was um, absolutely phenomenal. Um, the other thing that we, we found was that people were exercising. Um, just, these are just some of the videos. I don't want to be sexist, but <clears throat> um, they sent us all these images of, of the, uh, you know, from the time that they started playing the game to the time that they, they sent the images in. And many of these people lost you know, 10, 20 pounds um, over the course of several months. Um, we've also had stories about individuals who were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, who were immobile, couldn't get out of the house, started playing the game, and now they're completely mobile. They have a community that, that's supporting them. Um, and that was something that we thought was really compelling. And then there's uh, many people have also seen reductions in anxiety. <clears throat> um, and then friendships led to dating. Dating led to marriage, and marriage led to babies. And there's actually been several Niantic babies, and one of them is actually named after one of the characters in the story. Um, and then you, you could tell the, the impact that this had on um, some people as we created these logos, faction logos, um, during our beta period. Uh, early launch, I think we've been like a month, month and a half, uh, with a, this is something that one of our artists actually threw together, was fully intending on redesigning them at some later time until people started putting them on their body. Um, <clears throat> and we had quite a few of those, uh, I think, we, that was when we realized that we can't change it. <laughs> <clears throat> so the things that we learned, uh, games rooted in reality can change player behavior, promote meaning, meaningful new social interactions, encourage exploration locally as well as distant, <clears throat> and uh, promote physical activity, which were all things that we thought were really beneficial. And so we started working on Pokemon Go. Uh, Pokemon Go started from an April Fool's joke in 2014. Um, it kind of showed us that people were really interested in chasing Pokemon around the planet, even though they were sitting at their desk. Um, we wanted to create a game that was more, uh, unlike Ingress, we wanted to create a game that was more accessible through um, all age groups, um, large and small. Um, the concept made a, lot of challenge, made a lot of sense to us, um, but we had a lot of challenges in order to get along the way. We wanted to leverage the things that we learned from Ingress. Um, one of the challenges was we didn't believe in the technology, this in the gyro-based stabilization, um, that mobile, mobile camera-based technology was actually sufficient for this, this work. So we used photospheres. Uh, photospheres are akin to the same thing you see in Street View at Google. Um, we were in Google, so we could use these things. Um, the problem was Street View is focused on streets, not on walking, on pathways, um, trails. So you know, the things that are centered in the middle of the street don't provide really great opportunities for gameplay, especially when you're trying to motivate people to get out and walk around as opposed to drive around. And so from that, we decided to pursue other augmented reality hardware. And this is back in 2011, actually, no, 20, 2014. Um, so, you know, the Google Glass type device and then the, the huge visor, which looks rather imposing. Those were the first things. We also realized that these things are really um, they're very niche. Um, not everybody has them. It really wouldn't get us the broad appeal that we wanted. Um, so we focused on, on what we had available today, which were mobile handsets. Um, and then we played around with it. Um, we have a prototype. <clears throat> First thing we did, and this is actually a video, if we can get it to play, um, that shows kind of the early prototype for the counter mechanic. Um, So most of you who play the game have, have seen this. Um, it is what exists in the, in the game today. We also did some battle prototypes. These are in our office in, uh, I think this is in San Francisco. Oh, this is Seattle. <clears throat> and you can see the battling the Pokemon. <clears throat> and then after we showed this to the team, it was like, oh, yeah, this looks really awesome, and it looks like it will really work. And so that is where Pokemon Go ended up. Um, we polished it up, and then once we launched it, people started talking about augmented reality. Um, 
One of the things that we saw people um, using pretty heavily was the, sh the sharing, it's digital storytelling. Um, finding Pokemon, taking pictures of them, and then sharing it with the rest of the world. And they did some pretty interesting things. Um, probably all seen the diglets on the toilets. Uh, those, that was probably the most prevalent one for a long time. Um, and then we, we launched the product. And how did that go? Um, I don't know if you uh, guys have ever seen this. Um, this the, there's three lines on this graph. The first one is the original launch target. That's one. The second one is the is what we expected our worst case to be, and that's where we provisioned our systems for. And the green line is what actually happened. And, and you'll notice at the beginning, the green line starts above our original launch target. That was Australia and New Zealand. They were two and a half times, just that, those two countries alone, contributed two and a half times above our, our estimated post-global rollout utilization of our systems. Um, and so this, this actually happened over the course of maybe a month, month and a half. So this is, so th this looks all really well and good. You can imagine what the team looked like. Um, that's that's kind of where we were. Um, the thing that, that really kept us going, though, was what happened in the community. And then we'll watch this quick video here. Um, about two weeks after we launched, there was a crawl that started in in uh, San Francisco. Um, and it's hugely motivating when you're totally stressed out and you can walk outside and you can see this thing happening. There were 9,000 people that showed up for this. And they walked around San Francisco for about uh, two or three hours, I believe. Um, in fact, the day that this happened, um, our servers had gone down. And they threatened to march on our office. And the last thing we needed was 9,000 people walking down the Embarcadero after us. Um, <clears throat> and then people started to self-organize. So this is in Sydney. Uh, this is another event that they did. Um, and then, then these kinds of things happen. I don't know if you guys have seen this. Um, there is a Snorlax in a park around this corner. <clears throat> and this is, this is in Taiwan. Um, and just the sheer number of people moving to go grab this Snorlax. You've probably seen the one in Central Park where people are racing to go grab a Lapras. Uh, but a Snorlax is even more rare, so having these kinds of things. The, the, the really cool thing about this is that you can see everybody's included in this. It's like, it doesn't matter. It's like, uh, old, young, men, women, um, they're, they're all there, right? <clears throat> so this is, this is our UI today. Um, this is our statistics. Um, as of January 2017, we've, we've had 65 million monthly active users, over 650 million downloads of the application worldwide, about 9 billion kilometers walked, and 88 billion Pokemon caught. And, uh, Nine billion kilometers, to put them in perspective, that's the distance from Earth to Pluto. Um, and we've had some su pretty surprising benefits. Um, you know, people, people's social anxiety um, has been greatly reduced. Um, friends of mine have a severely autistic child, and the fact that he can go outside without having headphones on and interact with other people, something he never did, um, was, was hugely uplifting to the mother. And then there are... Um, cases where Pokemon Go was actually being used in hospitals for therapy for small children. If I'm trying to get a kid to raise his arms up or to squat down, I can say, hey, the guy's a little bit lower. Can you reach down and get him? And that's just a really tricky way that physical therapy or occupational therapy can get a kid to do the exercises that he was screaming and crying about five minutes ago that he didn't want to do. This kind of raises the general act. So good, skip the rest of that. Um, so what's coming next? Um, we got more cooperative gameplay, that's later this year. Um, we'll have new AR features as the te technology advances, um, but it's gonna take people creating the technology for us to exploit it. And then our goal is to plan for the future, but we're gonna use what's available today to provide the most entertaining uh, experiences for our players. Oh, and more tattoos. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat>